pleasure to welcome our speaker today. We have Dr. Simon Parrish coming from Norwich University. Last week we had um, George Princeton from oh. Norwich University. Yeah. We get a double shot at Norwich University this month. And he is an associate professor of biology there at Norwich, and he's here to share with us his research on the behavior of fish. And I think he has some exciting new research to share with us today, um, very recent findings. Um, so let's welcome our speaker. Hello. So um, I'd like to spend the first five minutes um, talking to you about my path uh, getting here to my position at Norwich University. Um, and it starts with uh, a, a double major in psychology and theater. Um, so I went to Indiana University for undergraduate. Um, and going into undergraduate, my plan was to become a counseling psychologist. Um, I'm really interested in behavior. I'm interested in contemplating emotions. And I really like listening to people. Um, so I enrolled um, with, with a plan to go on and get a master's degree in counseling psychology and become a practicing, practicing uh, counselor. Um, while I was at Indiana University taking my required courses, um, I, I took a course called Darwinian Medicine that talked about uh, how we can better understand uh, mental health issues through the lens of uh, evolution and something called evolutionary psychology, which has a sort of controversial place in science. So that's, it's interesting, but uh, I don't know if I can actually give it my stamp of approval. Um, but that set me off thinking about uh, evolution and taking more and more biology classes. And I was sort of hooked and, and sort of um, lost my way in, in the counseling psychology uh, direction and, and allowed myself to be uh, taken down this new path of um, research in biology. Um, I ended up uh, double majoring in psychology and biology um, in my second semester of my senior year is when I made that decision. So I stayed on for an extra year, right? I had five years of undergrad. Um, but I had to take a ton of classes there in the last uh, year and a half to get that major in biology. Um, a ton of really difficult classes, and I did not have time for the extracurricular uh, activities of working in a lab and, and, and getting some research under my belt. Basically, I wasn't marketable. Um, so, you know, I did what you do when you come out and you're kind of wandering around uh, in, in wondering where to go with your career. I uh, served fine dining in an Italian restaurant, and my apartment was about uh, a block from the biology building, so I looked up the names of all the professors that were studying uh, plant evolution, um, which is what I wanted to do, and I just walked into their labs and their offices, and I said, I would like to be here. You don't need to pay me. Just let me stay. Have me do something. Um, and so uh, I racked pipette tips for about a month, um, which is really just a very menial task. Uh, but eventually, you know, I, I, I kept showing up and, and they kept giving me more, more pipette tips to rack. And eventually I upgraded to counting sunflowers, sunflower seeds, and then eventually they let me plant some. And then they kind of explained the research. And about that time, uh, another job became available in another lab, um, but it was an animal lab. Uh, but it was a paying job, so I took it. Um, and um, after a couple of months uh, working for that professor, I was uh, managing his um, breeding colony of anolis lizards. Um, that was the serious research. But he also had a soft spot for uh, reptiles of all kinds. So he had a ton of large uh, snakes and lizards and all kinds of other reptiles and amphibians that people had um, decided they couldn't keep any longer and he had rescued. Um, so it was really cool to show my friends where I worked, basically. Um, he took a job, he was at Indiana University, and he took a job at uh, the University of Virginia uh, in Charlottesville, Virginia, and he invited me to come along. Uh, so I went and continued working as a lab technician at the University of Virginia for three years. Uh, 
During that time, I was surrounded by graduate students, and I got to know what their life was like and, and what they were doing, um, and decided that I really wanted to do that, that work. Um, and I made the decision to stick with animals, and I started looking for uh, a graduate program that I could enroll in, and uh, found one at the University of Illinois in uh, Urbana-Champaign. I worked under Allison Bell and uh, studied um, the, the research that I'm going to show you today on animal personality. Um, and uh, for five years, I had sort of the best and worst situation of my life. I had all the time in the world to read about all of the things that I wanted to read about uh, regarding animal behavior and research. And that was simultaneously fantastic because it was all up to me and horrible because it was all up to me. Um, but during that time, I, I sort of uh, carved out my niche. I decided I would like to focus on behavioral ecology um, and started doing research. Um, but in the meantime, I also uh, was required to teach classes as a teaching assistant. Um, I was really horrible at it the first time uh, which motivated me to get better at it. So I really started focusing on um, how I could get better as a teacher, and then I fell in love with teaching. Um, and so when uh, I, I graduated from my PhD program at the University of uh, Illinois, um, I started applying for jobs at small teaching institutions, just like Northern Vermont University. Um, and so I, I applied to 100 jobs, and I got a one-year teaching gig at SUNY Potsdam. As soon as I got to SUNY Potsdam, I talked to the um, chair of the biology department there and uh, told him that I would like to stay forever. And he said, that's not going to happen. We don't have a, a permanent position for you. And I said, OK, then I need a letter, a letter of recommendation so I can apply for 100 more jobs. Um, after applying to 100 more jobs, I landed the job at Norwich University. Um, and I'm very happy to be here in the heart of the Green Mountains. Um, I couldn't be happier, basically. So that's, that's kind of my story about how I ended up in this space. And now I'd like to talk to you about my research. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about personality from the perspective of a behavioral ecologist. And I'd like to start with two opposing views of individuality. So I've pulled these uh, two images from uh, popular culture. These are um, the TV shows that were influential to me when I was a kid. And so on the left, you'll see uh, Marty Stauffer. He is sort of, uh, he did uh, wildlife documentaries, sort of the precursor to uh, BBC Planet Earth. <clears throat> and um, in Marty Stauffer's um, uh, documentaries, he talked about, he, he would basically pick a species like wolves, and then he would spend the entire episode focusing on wolves and talking about all the characteristics of wolves. And he would sum up the entire species by talking about sort of the average behavior of individuals within that species, right? He would sort of summarize the entire species with a sort of generic, this is what this species does, this is how they act, this is how they make their living. On the other hand, you have Mr. Rogers. He focuses on the human species, and he stresses the importance of individuality and how every unique person is special and it's important to celebrate the, the individuality of, of, of uh, every single person. Now I'd like to talk about two opposing uh, views of individuality from the perspective of a biologist. So one perspective is the evolutionary view of individuality and really um, you don't have to talk about just behavioral traits here, you could talk about traits in general. Um, basically, uh, variation in, in behavior or any phenotypic trait um, could be viewed as just some random noise that falls outside of the uh, spectrum of the optimal phenotype. That variation 
on, on either side of the spectrum of sort of the optimal phenotype will eventually be uh, eroded away by the powers of natural selection. In other words, it's not important, it's just sort of an accident of nature, and eventually selection will, will erode it away. In other words, you're not special if, if, if you're focusing on, on that variation, you know, that Mr. Rogers had it wrong. It's, it's not important on both sides, right? And that wasn't very satisfying to me. I see that variation on, on uh, both ends of the spectrum as, as interesting, and I'm, I'm not alone. Over the last couple of decades, a growing number of behavioral ecologists have been challenging the view that variation in behavior is simply random noise. Personality, defined as within uh, species differences in behavior that are consistent across time or context, has been found in animals on all branches of the animal tree of life. From the lowly sea anemone to our closest relatives, the chimpanzees. In today's talk, I'll show you some of the research I have done to test the hypothesis that variation in behavior is adaptive. But there's another hypothesis that's received some support, um, and that is that behavioral variation persists because it is linked to some, uh, some underlying physiological constraints. So um, before I go on and talk about the adaptive nature of, of quote unquote personality, um, I'd like to um, give you that other perspective that talks about those underlying physiological constraints, because it's a really interesting uh, side you know, uh, detour that you could take um, if, that's, if that's your thing. So I want to give you the example of uh, the dark-eyed junco. Um, this is work by um, El uh, Ellen Ketterson. And what they found was that um, male dark-eyed juncos vary a lot in the amount of testosterone uh, that they express. Um, and so they were trying to understand why uh, this variation in testosterone would persist over time. Um, and what they found was one possible explanation is that males that vary in level of testosterone all have equal fitness. Um, and their uh, explanation for why this might happen is because um, there are different things that make you good, quote unquote, good at, at life, good at, at, at having reproductive success and, and therefore give you fitness. So on one hand, you could be a male that has really high testosterone. You can maintain a very large territory. You can be attractive to a lot of females. Um, and uh, you can do a good job of, of, of giving your song, right? So you have uh, stamina to, to um, make your uh, song so that it will attract females. On the other hand, that testosterone makes you a poor father. You're actually not very attentive to your offspring. And so um, your number of fledglings from your nest is actually kind of low. So those males, they end up with uh, good reproductive success because of extra pair copulation, where they are able to mate with multiple females, but then they don't do a good job of taking care of all those offspring. On the other hand, you have the males that have low testosterone, but are actually very good fathers, and they have a really high fledging rate. And so the connection between testosterone and multiple different ways that you sort of make a living and have high fitness um, leads to the maintenance of variation in testosterone. Okay, so before we go on, I just wanna have a textbook moment and sort of acknowledge um, a, a couple of ways that we can um, uh, get variation in phenotypic traits to start out with. So of course, on one hand, we have genetic variation. Uh, we get genetic variation through mutation, uh, crossing over and independent assortment give us recombination of uh, DNA. And so this is sort of the nature side of the origin of variation in phenotypic traits. 
On the other hand, we have the nurture side. And what I'm talking about here is uh, phenotypic plasticity. Organisms change their physical or behavioral phenotype in response to their environment. And so the image I'm showing here is an amphibious plant that if, if grown underwater, submerged, it has this sort of spindly appearance. And if grown as a terrestrial plant, uh, can also vary uh, a lot in its morphology depending on the temperature. So phenotypic plasticity can also give us trait variation. So those are two ways that we can generate variation in a phenotypic trait. What I want to talk to you, uh, um, uh, what I want to talk about next is how we maintain that trait variation, how we avoid losing that trait variation um, uh, through natural selection. And so I'm going to talk to you about sort of my favorite hypothesis uh, about how we maintain trait variation. <clears throat> and that is selection in a heterogeneous environment. Individuals within a population or within a species will experience different environments throughout their lifetime. They could experience different biotic environments, for example, different uh, predators or different concentrations of predators, different types of food, different types of prey, um, different uh, uh, quantities of prey, different availability of prey. Uh, of course, parasites and disease will vary from place to place and from situation to situation as well. On the abiotic side, uh, we can talk about temperature and precipitation, how much or how little temperature or uh, pre precipitation and how high or how, how low the temperature is on average, but also fluctuations in temperature and fluctuations in precipitation, sort of seasonality in a particular location. Um, soils and substrates are also important for terrestrial organisms. Um, and if we're talking about aquatic organisms uh, like I am, uh, water chemistry is really the most important thing. And so um, with individuals uh, experiencing differences in the biotic environment or the abiotic environment throughout their lives, um, they might be able to uh, survive by having a lot of phenotypic plasticity, or it's possible that they could um, just by chance end up in an env environment that's favorable to their phenotype. They could also end up by chance in an environment that's unfavorable. There are other mechanisms, though, that don't require just random chance. It's also possible that um, you could have a preference for a particular environment that's good for your phenotype, or a preference for a different environment that's actually bad for your phenotype, and that would be maladaptive. OK, so um, let me sort of formalize my hypothesis before I go on. The hypothesis I want to talk to you about uh, next is that behavioral variation is maintained by selection in a heterogeneous social environment. OK, so the environment here is um, your social surroundings, the other individuals of your own species. All right, I'd like to introduce uh, my first study subject. This is the three-spined stickleback. Uh, this species is actually quite famous among um, uh, animal behavior researchers, um, genetics researchers. Um, it's, it was one of the first uh, species to have its genome sequenced um, back when we moved uh, from humans to non-human animals. Um, so I could talk about the three-spined stickleback uh, for a long time. But I won't. I'm just going to tell you uh, just a couple of things about it. First of all, it's distributed throughout the northern hemisphere, um, sort of around the globe uh, in uh, nearshore marine habitats. And so there are populations that just live in the ocean near the shore. There are also uh, populations that are residential in freshwater in rivers and lakes. And there's a lot of really cool research that, again, I 
am having a hard time not just jumping into and telling you about uh, with those freshwater populations. Um, there are also anadromous populations that move from a marine habitat into freshwater to reproduce and then, and then go back out. I was doing research in uh, Northern California studying a population of three-spined stickleback, and I was looking for um, differences in the environment that might be favorable or unfavorable uh, for uh, variation in behavior. And what really, struck, what really struck me is that I was noticing sort of large groups of three-spined stickleback swimming around together. But I was also noticing a lot of individuals that were just sort of solo. They were just by themselves. And so this is what I'm going to treat as the social environment for this first part of the talk. I'm going to talk about loners, fish that are alone, fish that are not in a group on one hand. And on the other hand, I'll talk about fish that are in a group. Here I'm saying that they're in a shoal. Um, I might say that they're in a school. They're generally in a group. Um, and so I'll stop at this point and define shoal and school because I do use them interchangeably. Basically, you're pretty familiar with schooling. Fish are moving around in a coordinated fashion. They're sort of facing the same direction and all moving about the same speed. A shoal is a, a social aggregation of fish that's just a little bit less organized. They might be facing in different directions, not all moving in the same direction at the same time, but still a big group of fish. Okay, so the specific question that I wanted to answer in, in this study I'm telling you about is if the social environment, whether they're alone or in a group, impacts the fitness associated with being bold or cautious. So the uh, behavioral variation that I'm talking about here is your uh, propensity to take risks, whether you're bold or cautious. So I went out and collected uh, fish that were in the two social environments, loners and fish that were in shoals. And I collected about 400 fish for this particular study. Then we brought them into our field lab, which was basically kiddie pools sitting next to a river, and did an observation to give each fish a score for boldness, their risk-taking propensity. And I'm going to show you this video. It's difficult to see because the fish blends in well, which is, you know, kind of important for a tiny little uh, f uh, prey fish. All right, so before I start it, this red box is where the three spine stickleback is going to be. And it's going to be there until the large uh, model predator comes swooping into the pool. And then it's going to dart off to the side. So I'll, I'll play it and try to point it out to you. Okay, so here's our three-spine stickleback, and pretty soon it's going to dart way off screen over here. I'm gonna play that one more time and I'll pause it at the moment that it darts off of screen. Okay, so you can just barely see it right here, uh, taken, taken off and, and heading off screen. So this is the simulated predator attack, and the behavior that we quantified to decide whether they were a risk taker or not was how long they freeze after this simulated predator attack. So what they do is they dart really fast, and then they just hit the brakes and stop on a dime. And that effectively fools the predator because the predator's eyes see their lunch taking off, and then when the, when the stickleback stops, the predator's eyes keep going off into the distance and they sort of lose track of the, of the stickleback. And so if you freeze for a very short amount of time, if you freeze and you kind of look over at this, let me bring this guy, this predator out here. If you freeze for a very short time and then you come out and you start moving around with this big ugly predator in here, you're a bold individual. 
Uh, however, some individuals will dart and then freeze and then stay frozen for the entire, I think it was three minutes that we watched them uh, after this simulated predator attack. Um, those would be the more cautious fish. Okay, so on this slide, I'm showing you the initial data. This is all 400 fish divided up into, on top, you're looking at the fish that were uh, by themselves in a social environment uh, that we're calling solitary. Down at the bottom, you're looking at the fish that when I collected them, they were hanging out in a group. So they were in a social environment that's uh, shoaling. And uh, what you're looking at is two distributions of the amount of time frozen. So if they're way over here uh, to the right, uh, closer to this blue arrow, they have a long freeze time. These are the more cautious fish. If they're over here to the left, closer to that red arrow, those are the fish with a short freeze time. Those are the bolder fish. And so what you should take away from these uh, two figures is that the average freeze time didn't differ between solo fish and fish that were in a shoal. They all looked like they had, you know, there's, there's a, a wide distribution, but on average, those two groups didn't differ. The, the, the fish that were experiencing those two different social environments did not differ from one another. Um, the next step in the study was that I gave every single one of these tiny fish an individually identifiable tattoo with uh, uh, insulin syringes, which was really difficult, and I'm really proud of myself for doing it. Um, but I, that meant that I was able to um, identify each one after releasing them into the river. So what we did is we put them back into the river and left them for two weeks. The two weeks that we uh, left them in the river uh, was actually a really um, ideal situation for studying what happens when uh, fish with different phenotypes experience selection. Because what was happening in California was that there was a drought. Surprise, surprise, there was a drought in California. And it was so extreme that this section of the river that we did, where we did our research, was dried up downstream and upstream from our study site. So the fish could not leave. That was really good because I didn't want to study what happens when you make fish angry and they leave. The other really good part is that it concentrated uh, predation. So what you're looking at in this video uh, is a flock of common mergansers that visited every day for the entire two weeks and feasted on my study subjects. So I would go out and snorkel after I saw these mergansers and find uh, half-eaten fish everywhere. Um, so between the mergansers and otters and herons and all these other predators, um, my poor study subjects suffered uh, a lot of mortality and therefore a lot of selection uh, during these two weeks. At the end of two weeks, we went back and recaptured pretty much every fish, and that's section of river. Um, that was our goal at least, and we did pretty well. Okay, and so now I want to show you the results. When we compared the distribution of freeze times that we observed among the solitary fish at the beginning of the two weeks to the distribution of freeze times among the solitary fish that were recaptured at the end of two weeks, we see that mean freeze time shifted toward the more cautious end of the spectrum. What that means is that the bolder fish were less likely to survive among the fish that were experiencing a solitary social environment. So now let's look at the fish that were um, in a group. Their social environment was uh, in a group or in a shoal. Um, so among the shoalers, we see that the distribution of freeze times shifted more toward the bold end of the spectrum. This is the opposite of what we saw among solitary fish. So in summary, among group living three-spine stickleback, 
more cautious fish were less likely to survive. Among solitary three-spine stickleback, bolder fish were less likely to survive. Okay, so in the paper that we published using these data, we made several arguments for all why our results make intuitive sense. If you hang out in a large group all the time, it might make more sense to be bold. For example, you might need to throw caution to the wind in order to get enough food. It might also be beneficial to make a bold move toward the front of the school in the case of a predator attack. However, if you are predisposed to be more cautious, you're probably better off in a, with a solo lifestyle. You're already nervous uh, and watching your back for predators anyway, so why bother hanging out around a bunch of other members of your species that might steal your lunch money or actually just steal your lunch? <clears throat> okay, so I'm revisiting my hypothesis here. Uh, the hypothesis I wanted to test was if behavioral variation is maintained by selection in a heterogeneous social environment. And I think I uh, presented uh, some evidence to support that hypothesis. Selection favors bold behavior among three-spine stickleback that occur in groups. And selection favors more cautious behavior among solitary three-spine stickleback. <clears throat> I'm going to move on to a second hypothesis now, and I want to start with an apology. I'm going to make you forget the way that you were thinking about social. And the reason I'm doing this is because I went out and I talked about this research, and all of the good scientists around me put on their grouchy scientist hats and told me all the reasons I was wrong, and really what they were telling me is the alternative hypotheses. And so, I'm trying to put on my own grouchy scientist hat for my own research and take that opposite perspective. So the next hypothesis I want to talk to you about is that variation in social behavior, before I was talking about social as the environment, now I'm going to talk about social behavior as a malleable thing that can change over time. So my hypothesis is that social behavior, variation in social behavior is generated by phenotypic plasticity. So living in a group has pros and cons, right? And so I wanna to talk to you about the pros and cons from a, a, an evolutionary perspective. Um, being in a group, you might be able to uh, uh, detect predators faster or more effectively, um, or you might be able to avoid predators more effectively. Um, like in this picture, you can see that the shark is diving right towards the middle of the group, but the middle of the group keeps moving away from the shark and it, it can't focus in on any single individual. Um, living in a group can increase foraging efficiency. So for example, this uh, picture of llamas I have, uh, one individual might have its head up looking for predators and the other nine individuals can keep their head down and continue to forage. Um, you might also need to join a group for access to reproductive partners. So the red snappers that I have at the bottom of, my, of the screen, uh, they only reproduce in a large group. So if you would like to have some reproductive success, you have to join a group. But there are also costs to group living. So, group living can help you avoid predators, but of course, if you're in a giant group of uh, fish, for example, you're also going to attract more predators because you're uh, really easy to spot. Um, I've talked already a little bit about competition for food. That's a cost of being in a large group. And then unfortunately, I uh, have to talk about the transmission of disease and parasites, which we're all quite familiar with after the last couple years that if you are in a large group, transmissible diseases are more likely to spread. 
So I'd like to introduce the second study subject. This is the Brooks tickleback. And um, this one is found uh, around Vermont. In fact, the research that I'm going to show you today, um, uh, I'll show you a, a map of Vermont. And you'll see that some of the populations are actually quite close to here that I've been uh, studying uh, this summer. So the Brooks stickleback, a, a close relative of the three-spine stickleback, lives um, throughout the northern part of the eastern United States. And there are populations um, sort of scattered throughout the rest of the United States as well, even down into New Mexico. Um, they also live throughout southern Canada. So if, if Canada was showing on this map, you'd see a lot, a lot more colored in because they're really prevalent in the southern part of Canada. The most relevant uh, part about the biology of this species is that they are a wetland specialist. So this species, again, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this, but the three-spine stickleback, the brook stickleback, they are very small fish. So this would be a large one if you, if you look up here. This, this would be a very large one, actually. So they're really small fish. Um, and the brook stickleback is a wetland specialist. It, basically is really good at surviving in the low oxygen conditions that happen uh, when a pond or a wetland freezes over in the winter, which we know happens uh, pretty thoroughly here in Vermont. And so I don't, I, I, I'm thinking about how to write this data up and I'm, I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to achieve this because I don't have hard data to prove what I'm gonna say next. But um, if you are writing a paper, you could say through personal communications with Simon Parrish, I know that these guys don't really like being in rivers. Basically, um, what I'm basing that on is I have never found a, uh, a juvenile brook stickleback in a river. So they either get eaten up or their parents can't reproduce in the river. There's something going on. Um, that results in basically their, the age distribution in, in rivers of this species is just adults. And so what I think is going on is that it's a, it's a wetland species that reproduces in wetlands and they're very happy in wetlands and then every once in a while they end up going out into the river and can't find their way back to the wetland. Because they are found in rivers, but they don't seem to be able to reproduce there. Okay, so the specific question that I want to ask in this study is if Brooks stickleback behave differently when they are in rivers. So to answer this question, I collected, um, and, and this first part was uh, a project that I did with an undergraduate uh, way back in 2019. What we did is we went out to the wetland on Norwich campus where this species can be found in abundance and collected uh, a bunch of fish. And then we went to the adjacent river and collected the same species. And then we put them into our measurement of uh, grouping behavior. And so I've got another video here to show you how we measured grouping behavior. Um, so on the screen, you can see here's my kiddie pool. This is actually a pretty small kiddie pool. So those are really small fish. Um, and you're going to hear some beeping if the sound works. Uh, what we did was. Um, we, every 15 seconds for five minutes, we would, uh, when, that, when, when we heard that beep, we would note uh, if they were in a group, if they were in a group of uh, uh, two or three, or if they were all three spread out. And we also noted, I'm not gonna talk about it today, but we noted whether they were in those plants because um, plants are sort of an alternative to um, trying to find safety in numbers. And we wanted to provide them with some alternative to hanging out with other fish. So that first beep, 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 that was me, me taking notes. You know, I'm taking notes right now about what I saw. And then 15 seconds later, I'll have my eyes back on them. And what you're seeing at both of these points is basically that all three are within one body length of each other. So I would say that all three were in a group. And in fact, I would say that they were schooling in, in that scenario. As opposed to shoaling, I said they were shoaling if they were facing sort of more than 45 degree uh, angle from each other uh, or not swimming in a coordinated fashion.
<clears throat> All right, so here are the data. Um, to sum it up, basically river fish spend more time in a group than wetland fish. Um, so I also included the sample size here because, again, this was, these, were, these were preliminary data. Um, we just went out, I think it was just three trips, um, and the first one was a total bust. So um, this was just sort of a, a, t a trial run to see if, if this result that we had noticed in a, in a classroom activity uh, would carry over when we tried to formalize it and, and actually do some research. Uh, just because I love data and I love kind of tearing apart data and looking at what it means, um, I've got the same data in the second figure. I've just divided it up by what proportion of the time they were in a school, and that's the, the darker green up on top, versus the proportion of time that we would quantify it as a, a shoal, which is the lighter green on the bottom. So these data were cool, but totally insufficient because the sample size is really low, and in reality, we're only looking at one wetland versus one river, and so you could say that our, our sample size was really just one in that case, since it's a comparison of two different habitats. Um, so the next thing we did was we moved uh, sort of the same study methods into the laboratory, uh, which gave us several benefits. The first benefit is that it was what's called a common garden. So the fish were all kept in aquariums that were set up identically. They had the same number of fake plants, the same sort of layer of gravel under them. They received the same food. The water was literally the same water because it's a flow through system. So it's definitely the same temperature, same water chemistry. Uh, another advantage is that I had students come into the lab and do the scoring that were not actually interacting with the fish. So they had no idea whether they were looking at river fish or wetland fish, and therefore could not be biased and try to give me the results that I wanted. Um, so that's really important. So that's called, we had blind observers. And then finally, we increased the sample size. So uh, we're gonna end up with uh, over 30 groups of three from each habitat. Okay, and so when we did that, we found that the river fish still spend more time in a group than the wetland fish. So you can see here our sample sizes were 36 and 39, and uh, the data looks pretty similar to the way it did when we did our uh, testing uh, out in the field. And this is actually in 2021, so it's two years later. So, you know, things could have happened. Uh, there was, I think there was probably a flood sometime in there that actually connected the wetland to the river, so the fish had opportunities to switch back and forth. All kinds of things could have gone uh, astray with this result, but it seemed to hold. Again, though, the big problem here is that it's just one wetland versus one river. That, that doesn't really equal a replicable uh, scientific result. So I spent this summer and um, the first part of, of this fall, in fact, you know, just, uh, just finished up collecting these data uh, not too long ago. And I went around and I found four geographically isolated populations that were in separate watersheds, right? So each of the red stars on this map of Vermont uh, show uh, four different wetland river pairs where I could go into a wetland and then I could go into the adjacent river and, and get fish and do the behavioral testing. And so here are the data from uh, four geographically isolated populations. So I think these data finally have convinced me that it might be time to publish this result and say that river fish definitely spend more time in a group than wetland fish. Um, so on, on this figure, you're seeing that I have uh, river wetland pairs from the Lamoille River drainage, the Mallets Bay drainage, the Missisquoi River drainage, and the Winooski River drainage. Um, and we're seeing pretty similar results in, in each case. Um, it's kind of interesting actually that this, this Winooski, this is my original study population. 
they actually have sort of the weakest difference when you, when you look across the population. So when I went out and looked at more populations, uh, the effect only got stronger. Okay, so I'm saying river fish definitely spend more time in a group than wetland fish. And I'm really excited about this result because what I'm hoping to do is publish it this, uh, this winter. And from then on, I've got um, sort of a, a, a great research question that's ready-made for students like you. And I'm actually going to ask you to give me some ideas now. So if you've, if you've started to fall asleep, this is the time when you have to wake back up because I'm going to ask you to guess why. Why are river fish spending more time in a group than wetland fish? Yeah? Because there's, um, well, there's more predators in the river? Maybe? More predators in the river is a good guess. Some people guess there are more predators in, in the wetland. I think that you're probably right that there are um, more predators in the river. But what I can definitely say is there are def different predators uh, in the river versus the wetland. So um, I I'll try not to say more because I in case somebody else wants to talk about that, I don't want to drive the whole conversation. So go ahead. Um, more plant life in the wetland, more places to hide. That's definitely one of the ideas that I like. Um, this species um, spends a lot of time standing quite still. Um, and they, it, when they're in a river, they do tend to be close to plant life. So that's a good one. Yeah? Does the water flow differently in the two different environments? Water flow differences, right? So the wetland um, doesn't have much flow except for when it's rained a whole lot. And even then, it's a lot slower than the river. Because when it rains a whole lot, then the river becomes, um, you know, cascading rapids. Yeah. On top of there being more predators in the river, the water is more like clear in a river, so you can easily kind of pick out your prey. Mm -hmm. So water clarity is another really good one that would be pretty easy to test. If having the water being really clear most of the time in the river um, uh, affects their behavior uh, versus um, having sort of brackish, or not brackish, um, uh, the water that has sort of the tannins in it, it's kind of a brownish color uh, in a wetland, might make it harder for predators to see. And so they, they use a different anti-predator strategy in those two situations, yeah. Any other ideas? Yeah? I know that you mentioned that they're more comfortable in the wetlands, and they, when they venture out into the rivers, they tend to get lost. So maybe it's like this grouping technique that they can find their way back um, or they, to survive uh, with predators more. I don't know. Yeah, so perhaps when they end up in the river, they're thinking, uh, this place is horrible. Why am I in this river? Hey, there's another brook stickleback. I bet it's headed to the wetland. Interesting. The problem with a lot of these ideas, though, is that when we did take them to the lab, and put them in a common garden, right? We took the wetland fish and we took the river fish and we put them in aquariums that were identical and left them that way for a couple of weeks and then pulled them out at groups of three at a time. It didn't fade. They continued to have differences in behavior. That's the really weird thing for me. Did you have one? I had one that said. Okay. Yeah, sorry. One more? Because the environment that mature, you were saying that there's no juveniles in the river. Um, yeah, I, I have a lot of questions I'm thinking about. Like, I did make the unjustified claim that there are no juveniles in the river. It's, it, yeah, it's a plot. And also the reproductive partners. Um, if they're grouped together like that, it, it kind of like, there's like a discrepancy. Because? If uh, they were grouped together in the rivers, wouldn't they be more proliferating? Yeah, OK. So if, they're, if they hang out in groups in rivers, wouldn't we actually expect them to have an easier time finding social part or uh, 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 reproductive partners, and then maybe actually um, have a larger populations in the rivers? And 
but that's not what we're seeing. And so actually I'll stop for a second and give you a little bit of stickleback biology just because I think it's great because um, I'm a dad. Uh, so in sticklebacks, in both the Brooks stickleback and the three-spine stickleback, uh, males build a nest um, oftentimes close to or sort of hidden in vegetation. Um, they actually change one of their internal organs into a glue producing organ. It sort of metamorphosizes into a glue producing organ and they glue together bits of plant and algae and they build a nest and then they do a courtship dance and they have bright coloration or dark coloration if you're a book stickleback um, to attract females and they get the females to go into the nest and lay eggs and then they chase the females away and they do everything else for the babies. They fertilize the eggs, they um, will uh, uh, aerate the nest uh, by using their tail fin to push water through the nest every waking moment until the eggs hatch. Then after the babies hatch, uh, they'll go out and retrieve the babies and bring them back and spit them in the nest, which teaches the babies how to avoid getting eaten by predators later on. So stickleback dads are amazing, on a side note. Any other ideas? Yeah? Differences in activity levels is, is a great question. It's possible that the wetland fish are just sort of very sluggish and they just don't want to move around a lot. That, that is a possibility. I didn't quantify that though. So I don't have the answer to your question, but that's definitely a, a, a good way to challenge the idea. Maybe it's not that they want to be together, but just they, you know, they're just swimming around and they just happen to be together more because they're swimming around. Yep. Okay. All right, so I'm going back to this hypothesis that I said I was sort of trying to test. Variation in social behavior is generated by phenotypic plasticity. So I think that I have tentatively supported this because uh, brook stickleback collected from rivers spend more time uh, in a group than those collected from wetlands. And I really think that um, at least, I guess I shouldn't say I really think, um, the idea that I'm working with is that the fish in the river are the wetland fish, they've just ended up in the river for some reason. Because the wetland is adjacent to the river and every time it floods, it's not adjacent to the river, it is the river, right? So I'm sort of treating these as one population with sort of two microhabitats. However, it could be plasticity or it could be something called habitat dependent selection. Basically, you could have uh, very social and asocial fish accidentally getting in the river, but once you get out there, if you aren't very social, you get eaten or you starve to death or something happens to you. So all that I see are the social ones because the asocial ones that go to the river get selected out of that trait variation pool. Another idea is that it could be phenotypic, uh, phenotype dependent dispersal. It's not that you go to the river and then become social. It's that you're one of the very, very social wetland fish. And for some reason that sends you out to the river. You follow that guy blindly and that guy takes you to the river for whatever reason, you know? So it could be that the very social uh, individuals are dispersing differently than the asocial individuals, and that is somehow causing them to end up in the river. So there are always alternative explanations, and that's kind of why I like this result, is because I can keep coming up with new ideas about why it's happening and then go out and test them with my students over and over again for the next rest of my career. Okay, so I'd like to wrap up uh, just by saying thanks to some collaborators. So up on the top, uh, Miles Bensky was a fellow graduate student in Allison Bell's lab. So Allison Bell was my uh, academic advisor at the University of Illinois uh, for my PhD. Um, she taught me everything I know about writing, uh, which was the most amazing gift 
I've ever received from an educator because I didn't know how to write at all, basically. Um, so thanks, Allison. Uh, in 2019, the student that collected the first bit of data, uh, Will Elaine, uh, she was an uh, early college student um, coming from Montpelier to uh, Norwich. And she's now at the University of Delaware. She's a senior, and she is actively seeking a PhD advisor. Um, so she's going on to grad school. Uh, in 2021, the data that was collected in the lab was done by Hannah Ko Kowalewski, uh, Zhu Zheng Wu, and Zeb Peralt. Uh, all three of them have uh, great success stories that have taken them off in different directions uh, as well. Um, I got funding for the first part from a doctoral dissertation improvement grant uh, from the National Science Foundation um, to finish up the data collection for that piece. And uh, this most recent data, the second part that I showed you, um, is supported by what, what Norwich calls an independent study leave grant. That basically means that this fall I am not teaching. Instead, I am working strictly on research. So I'm going to spend the rest of the fall writing up this data and, and publishing it, thanks to Norwich University. Um, and I also received a research expenses grant from Norwich University um, for the bits and pieces that I need to purchase along the way to make this research happen and some stuff that I'm going to do with genetics um, and, and genomics uh, with some of the, the tissue I've collected along the way as well. So I just, I, w I, I just want to say thank you so much to Norwich University for um, supporting research. I know it's, it's hard at small institutions um, and so it, it feels really I feel really privileged to have that opportunity. And then I also want to say thanks to you and Northern Vermont University for bringing in um, uh, researchers and, and showing young people all of the variety of ways that you can go on in the future and utilize your education. Uh, because as I mentioned, I started out a psychology major and I didn't mention but my double major was also theater. So it was very different when I started. And the path that you are weaving right now um, can take you just about anywhere. So thanks for having me. Questions? Yeah. So w when I set up what's called the common garden, um, I wasn't trying to simulate uh, river versus wetland. I was trying to give them something halfway between so that they all had to deal with the same surroundings right up till the moment they got tested, right? And so the expectation there was if you get taken out of a place with a lot of plants like a wetland and put into a kiddie pool, uh, maybe you just go hide in the plant and you don't swim around. But if I take you out of a place that has a lot of plants and I put you in, a, in an aquarium that has a moderate amount of plants, you'll do a moderate amount of social behavior, right? That would say, well, it was, it was the experience of being taken straight from plants, right? And so if you're taken from the river and there's not a lot of plants, then you're really social and it's really about that, you know, that experience of being taken from a place with no plants and then shown a few plants, right? But it, it didn't go that way. When I took wetland fish and river fish and put them into a common garden, when I put them into aquariums that were all identical, they maintained those differences in social behavior. That doesn't mean that they didn't develop that social behavior over the months prior to me collecting them. What it does mean is that it was something that wasn't reversible easily, right? So there are a lot of traits that are really reversible, like you know, your mood. That's a really reversible behavioral trait. But there are other traits like, I don't know, neuroticism that don't change very quickly you kind of develop the way that you are and then you kind of stick with it. And it's, it's a lot harder to change. 
But that doesn't mean it didn't develop from your experiences growing up. Right? Yeah. I apologize if you already discussed this, but my previous understanding of sticklebacks is that the ocean like species happens in more like lateral plates than the like river species. So do you think that like have you incorporated that to your study? Do you think that the behavioral differences are to the physical differences the other For sure, yeah. So, um, so just to repeat, so, so that people that are you know on on camera know, um, you brought up uh, some of the really famous research on three spine sticklebacks, um, showing that there are differences in the <clears throat> num the amount of plating they have. They sort of have this armor plating along their side, where they actually have bones along their side. Um, in the marine population, that's really common. And there are just a few that have lost, that, that have a, a, a genetic mutation that means that they don't have that plating. Whereas in freshwater, there are a lot of freshwater populations that are almost completely void of that armor plating. It's there, but it's really not very prevalent. And that's thought to be an adaptation to those freshwater habitats. So for sure, yes. I would definitely say that if you have armor plating, you might be a little bit less risk averse, right? So yeah, I definitely think that there's opportunities for students to say, well, you know, maybe the fish that are really social are really social because there's some other um, physical trait, some anatomical trait or some physiological trait that makes them able to be successful in a social setting. And there's some uh, version of that trait that makes the wetland fish just m more, you know, better in a solitary situation. Um, yeah. Yeah, so the question is, how did the, um, basically, how did I give them tattoos? Um, these were actually really small. They were, this is a small fish, right? This is a big one. I was actually in, in that study studying juveniles. So they were um, 20 millimeters to 25 millimeters long. Um, so it had to be a really tiny dot. Um, there's a company called uh, Northwest, Northwest, I can't think of it right now off the top of my head. Um, but if you look up Northwest and fish ID or tagging, uh, you'll find them. They sell a two-part uh, material that you mix together, um, and it's fluorescent, right? It's like hot pink and bright orange and bright yellow and bright green. And um, you mix it up, you put it into an insulin syringe, and then you hold the fish and you can get just the tip of the needle just barely under the top layer of skin and put just a tiny little dot of bright yellow. And um, you can put four dots on a fish and then maybe flip it over and put four dots on the other side if you're doing a lot of fish. But I just needed to do four dots in a row on one side of the fish. Um, and it's a, a unique combination of the yellow, the orange, the green. Um, and What's really cool is then when we went and did the recollection um, and, and just brought in a seine net that was just full of fish, we would dump it into a bucket and then take a black light flashlight and shine it into the bucket and <laughs> put a tarp over our heads and we looked crazy basically sitting on the side of the river under tarps with a black light flashlight in a bucket. Um, but if there was a marked fish in there, they would just glow, right? So, so it was really easy to see if we had collected one of our marked fish. And then when we pulled it out and looked at what the, the combination of marks was, we knew this was a solitary fish that was particularly bold, you know, has this particular boldness score. Yes? Um, do you think, like, you're studying these fish and they're so That's a great question. So 
the question was, you know, here I am putting fluorescent dots along the side of these baby fish and then putting them back in the river. It's very possible that predators would have been able to see them um, you know, more easily, even if they were in a big group of fish. That's totally possible. That is totally possible. However, I feel okay about it because, for the, for the science, I feel okay about it, um, because I didn't just do that with the social fish and left the, the solitary fish, you know, with their uh, innate camouflage, right? So I sort of did the same thing to every individual. So they all had an equal, equally elevated chance of being uh, predated. But that's, that's definitely a problem, you know? That's, there's papers published just about that, for sure. Um, so you said that you were able to find the fish that were single-backs near the Norwegian campus. Were you able to find them within the dock? Is that where you're thinking of them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a wetland right by the rugby pitch, just across the river from the rugby pitch, um, and it has I tried to do a population estimation, and with, you know, 100% error, like, I have no accuracy on this estimation, but um, it seems like there's like 10,000 of them in that tiny little wetland. Every time I put a, a, a small minnow trap down, it's full of like 60 of them overnight. Um, whereas in, in the river, I have to put like 10 traps down to get like 30 fish. Yeah, um, it floods probably every, you know, in my experience, maybe four years, there's a flood that connects the wetland to the river. Um, some of these other places, though, they were directly, I think all the rest of them, they were directly connected to the river. So the fish should be able to freely swim back and forth basically all of the time, except for in the most extreme drought. So you said there's multiple directions you can go next. Do you have a plan for what's the next time to be? Well, what I'd really like to do next is find out um, the uh, genetic distance between these populations, right? So I, I took tissue samples um, uh, along the way. So I am hoping that I can um, establish that the river wetland pairs really are just one population, that there's a lot of, of intermixing between those pairs. But it'd be even better if they weren't. That would just be crazy if the wetland right adjacent to the river has a completely genetically distinct population. That would be amazing, but I do not expect that to happen. What I do expect, though, is that the Lamoille drainage will be genetically distinct, you know, genetically distant from uh, the Mallets Bay from the Missisquoi and from the Winooski, they, there won't be a lot of interbreeding between those because to get to each other, they would have to go through Lake Champlain or a fisherman's bucket, I guess. But hopefully that's not happening at very high of a level. Um, so that's where I'm headed next. Um, but uh, I, I really am hoping to just let students sort of lead it. I mean, there are some low-hanging fruit that's just obvious you know, if, if a student comes to me and says, I want to do research, but I'm not sure what to do, what you guys talked about are definitely on my, on my list, my, you know, my short list of, of ideas to test. So we'll just test them all. And hopefully we can find a way to not just be biased and pick the one that actually showed us something, but actually publish a paper that says, we tested like these three ideas and we showed that these two, like, you know, water clarity doesn't matter, but current does matter or something like that, right? And, and hopefully get out uh, the testing of a lot of different ideas. Yeah? Is there any reason that you think yeah, in general, I think marine stickleback are, are more likely to school. There's actually a really cool paper where um, this was sort of in the early days of, of being able to do whole genome sequencing. And, um, and some researchers that were really well funded, what they did is they took um, 
uh, they took all their money and they, they threw a lot of money at the problem and they found that there are distinct parts of the genome that code for more or less social behavior, more or less um, hanging out close to other individuals and also a separate part of the genome, I think on a separate chromosome, uh, determines whether they face like perfectly in the same direction or if they are facing apart a little bit more, like l not quite as tightly oriented, right? And the way they did that was they recorded, they, first you have to do a lot of fish breeding to set up the perfect genetic cross between a marine fish and a freshwater fish. And then the other thing that you have to do is be able to very rapidly uh, phenotype the behavior of a lot of fish, and that's not easy because you have to sit there usually and watch the fish for a whole five minutes. So what they did was they set up a whole array of pools with cameras watching them, recorded them all at the same time, and then fed it through uh, a computer program that could track the fish's um, location and whether they were oriented together. So it was like super high tech, really, really well funded. And, and, um, and I actually I know for a fact that the grad student that was involved, um, she was able to do it uh, because her partner was a computer programmer and built the program they used to track the fish for her. So <laughs> you really have to have the right circumstances to be able to pull that study off. But it's a pretty cool study. Yeah. Thank you so much.